Consider an annulus in the plane and let gamma be the family of all paths that connect the two boundary components of this annulus. One of the key facts about modulus in the plane is that this path family has modulus precisely equal to 2 pi divided by log of the outer radius over inner radius. In particular, the modulus depends only on the ratio of the inner and outer radius. And you could have very differently sized annuli with the same modulus. In fact, in previous lecture, we used this fact to prove that the modulus of all path through one point is zero, which is consistent with the limit behavior here as R1 goes to zero. My goal is in two lectures to provide a completely detailed proof of this theorem. Initially, I didn't anticipate it to be so involved. It's usually often left as an exercise. It's doable, but it needs a lot of um, care and precision if one wants to get the full rigor. And that is my goal in these two lectures. First, we want to prove the direction that this... Uh, mod is less than or equal to this quantity and in next lecture we will use some polar integral techniques to prove the opposite direction. First of all before I continue with proof let me show you a heuristic argument of how one comes up with an admissible function. Also the definition of modulus is given up here. So we want a function that charges every path to at least one. A naive ap approach here would be that you take rho to be, well, if you have any curve, it travels at least the girth of this annulus, which is r2 minus r1. So that length integrate, if you integrate the quantity r2 minus r1 over um, such path, this is a constant function, so integral of rho over gamma will be bigger than um, this constant multiplied the length of gamma, so this will be bigger than 1, great. And also, we don't need to um, set this quantity equal to anything outside the annulus. Even if a curve goes outside and comes back, this will charge the correct subpath of it. We will see similar argument below. Uh, however, this is not optimal for infamizing the integral, L2 integral, because you're assigning same weight out here to here. But a more clever option will be to have a higher value of rho near zero and uh, smaller values of rho down here as you move away from it. Because... Um, for the path integral, you could still get bigger than 1 by compensating uh, the large versus small quantities of rho. But when you come to integrate the L2 norm, um, it makes a lot of sense to have a smaller weight here because that weight is integrated over a much larger area compared to when you are close to the origin. You have to... Um, Imagine extreme cases where the outer radius is, say, 100 times larger. So you'd rather concentrate your row near the very beginning um, than uh, having same distribution over, over all radii. So when, once some, someone considers such uh, arguments, it's quite easy to come up with uh, the next thing, which is, well, um, have your row function be proportional to how far you are away from the origin. So the closer to the origin you are, the larger quantity. So that's why this absolute value of z goes down into denominator. And the farther away you go, it's smaller. Also, because of the whole symmetry of the picture, you want a symmetric function, which, which, with which I mean rotationally invariant. So that's why uh, this absolute value of z appears so that it only depends on the modulus. And uh, again, you don't want anything outside the annulus. You won't need it. 
So you multiply with the cutoff. And uh, we will see that this beta is the right number, which uh, similar to what happened here, you, you put up front so that you will integrate to more than one. And this beta is uh, um, this uh, log two over log r, log r two over r one, which is uh, different from alpha up to this two pi factor. So this row is obviously a Borel function. Now let's prove that this is in fact admissible. And once this row is admissible, uh, its L2 integral will be an upper bound for this. And L2 integral will be alpha. But let's first prove it is in fact admissible. And this is what I, ante I didn't anticipate to be so involved. You want to prove that if you take any rectifiable path in your family, the integral of rho over that will be at least 1. So if your gamma is rectifiable, you can always assume uh, without loss of generality that it is arc length parameterized, say over in interval 0, L to C. Um, because the length of any such path is at least r2 minus r1, so L definitely is bigger than r2 minus r1. Now we need to show that this gamma is bigger than or equal to 1. Now, since our row does not assign any weight outside the annulus, its support is just within the annulus, you cannot count on picking any line integral for parts of the path that potentially leave the annulus. And um, that's why we need to, so visually, we need to find the subpath that remains within, within the annulus. So I have drawn two paths. So let's say gamma, the red one, is rather simple. It leaves in a simple fashion and then returns. Um, here I want to take this subpath, which uh, for the whole time remains in the annulus. For the blue path, it's not so obvious, so it has this sine curve-like behavior, um, but it's still I wanna talk about maybe from here to here. This becomes my gamma tilde. Um, I can, of course, imagine that there's much more complicated path and again, I want to find the subpath. Maybe here, I want to go from here to here. This becomes my gamma tilde. But uh, of course, pictures can never be proofs. Uh, they just guide us to see what we want. Um, our paths are not oriented, but without, again, loss of generality, we can start on the inner radius and move towards the outer radius. Um, that's why to find the right subpath, so what is the subpath that remains in there? Um, this is not unique though, but at least one such subpath exists, and uh, now I want to tell you how to find it. Um, we, our curve, okay, starts here. Suppose it goes back into, uh, towards origin, and then does some wiggly things and wants to come back. It uh, starts going out in the annulus, but then changes its mind and goes back into there, does more magic, and then returns again. And who knows, maybe it will do that again or not. However, analysis and the compactness and continuity give us the right tools to define um, a few parameters. So, a parameter, identify special numbers in the domain of definition of gamma t. So we assumed without loss of generality that gamma of uh, 0 belongs to the inner radius, so this is r of 1, and gamma of the last point in the interval is as r2. So we define t1 to be the last time that uh, my path uh, sees the inner circle. 
so it goes back in comes out go goes back in comes out maybe even travels along the very s circle but there is one last time it has to say goodbye and never return there and uh, the last time can be identified as the supremum so you take supremum of all t so that gamma of t either is inside too much is inside the inner radius or on the inner circle uh, we can see that this of course is non-empty set because zero is there and then by continuity we can also see that at this very value t1 um, this does belong to the circle so this is equal to r1 and clearly again by continuity and compactness argument we see that t1 is strictly less than l because at l you are on the outside circle now t1 is um, the last time the path says goodbye to the inner circle and it begins its travel towards that one um, and then <clears throat> We want to see the first time it reaches there. So it may bounce back, but we know that it will never go all the way back to the inner circle. That's great news. It can delay and, um, you know, beat around the corner. And, uh, but somewhere, sometime, it will have to meet the outer circle because L is there waiting. Again, compactness, continuity, and stuff like that help us define the following T. This is the infimum, which will be the first time infimum T value after T1. Whether we need this assumption or not, it's intuitively... I don't want to prove that we don't need this assumption, so why not? So T is bigger than T1. And gamma of t is on the outer radius or even beyond that again here i can just put equality but let's put this one they are all equivalent and then we see that this is a non-empty set so um and then infimum is defined and again by continuity we see that gamma of t2 itself belongs, I mean, has modulus equal to, has norm equal to r2. And uh, we also see that t2 is definitely strictly bigger than t1. Um, indeed, okay, we can exactly give a much better bound so indeed, gamma tilde, which is gamma restricted to now T1, T2, um, joins, obviously, so joins uh, boundary to boundary, is arc length parameterized, because the original gamma is, so this is arc length parameterized, Um, hence, this T2 minus T1 is, um, which is length of gamma tilde, and because it joins boundary to boundary, is at least R2 minus R1. So this will be important bound that actually we will use. <clears throat> so out of any path, rectifiable path, we have... Actually, here we didn't need rectifiability uh, for finding T1 and T2. Out of any continuous path, we have found a subpath which um, remains within the annulus forever. But this particular subpath we found is arc length parameterized. Now, our goal was to prove that this integral rho ds over gamma is bigger than 1. So we say, okay. Um, 
because our claim is to be true for all rectifiable path that join boundary to boundary, in particular, it has to be true for gamma tilde of rho ds. But gamma tilde is arc length parameterized, so we can say uh, rho of gamma tilde of t dt. Um, here now I'm going to use the following fact. You have a path that is arc length parameterized. So for t between t1 and t2, first of all, gamma of t, because of the choice of t1 and t2, uh, is strictly bigger than R1 and less than R2. It is in the annulus. And gamma tilde of T... So you have started on the inner boundary and then you have moved exactly T length. Because it's arc length parameterized, Gamma tilde of T compared to gamma tilde of T1, um, it has traveled precisely T minus T1 length. And how far away from the origin can it get? The farthest distance from the zero that you can get by traveling T1 minus T1 distance is that you go directly, you go straight in, in the radial direction for the amount of t minus t1. And that puts you somewhere um, here. So inner radius is r1 and you move t, t, t minus t1 length in the same direction. So the length of this thing will be at most r1 plus t minus t1. We could also re-parameterize so that gamma tilde is uh, parameterized from 0 to something, then this would be just t instead of t minus t1. But but um, why, why do that? It's a bit longer to write, but uh, also less tricky. It's brute force calculation. So again, this bound comes from the fact that you know that you start at or one distance from zero, and then you at when you reach gamma t, you have you have traveled a length exactly equal to t one minus t t minus t one. Even if you traveled in the most optimal way to get away from zero, this is farthest you could make. So how does this help us? So uh, from this star, we see that rho ds will be bigger than integral over gamma tilde. Well, this is from t1 to t2. And then um, rho has this formula, beta inverse. 1 over absolute value of gamma of t dt. Now, gamma t is has that um, upper bound. It goes into the denominator, so direction changes. So from t, this will be from t1 to t2. Um, this beta, beta inverse is just a number we put outside. And then here we put dt. And then this would be R1 plus T minus T1. And here goes 1. If you calculate this integral, you exactly get uh, beta inverse. And this is uh, antiderivative is ln. So you plug in T1, you get R1. And you plug in T2. Um, oh, okay, so this is at actually bigger than, so let's do one more inequality. T2 minus T1 we showed is at least R2. Wait, um, the gap between T1 and T2 
here we showed is at least r2 minus r1 so this is from t1 t1 plus r2 minus r1 and then the rest is the same r1 plus t minus t1 and now this is equal to finally beta inverse take ln so this will be log if you plug in the upper bound t1 cancels t1 r1 cancels r1 you get r2 minus log r1 but this is actually equal to 1 and uh, finally we have proven this so um, it took some work because remember this gamma here can be anything can again leave bounce back multiple times we reduced it i mean we made it we found a sub curve in it gamma tilde and uh, well the rest continued from there so this shows that gamma tilde I, gamma we sorry rho that we have is admissible so this proves rho is admissible the claim is proved so we have one admissible function therefore modulus of gamma is less than or equal to integral of uh, this particular rho that we had against uh, Lebesgue 2 measure over R2 but this is integrating over the annulus R1 and R2 um, the function we have beta inverse to the power 2 so that will be beta to the negative 2 1 over z to the power 2 dm and here um, you should bring your polar coordinate knowledge it's a radial function over an annulus so um, beta in to the negative 1 0 to 2 pi that's where 2 pi finally comes in and then this will be from r1 to r2 1 over t squared and the d dr dt so this will be a t dt i'm using like t for what people would use um would where people would use r in the polar coordinate so t is my r uh, but look this is a uh, beta to the negative two um this inner integral is again log of r2 over r1 and then um d theta and then this is independent of theta so you just multiply by 2 pi and uh, this is a uh, beta itself so this becomes 2 pi beta inverse which is just alpha so 2 pi divided by log of r2 minus r1 so this proves that modulus of my family is less than or equal to this because I found one particular admissible function satisfying this upper norm. So next lecture, I'm glad that I broke this down into two lectures, is that uh, any other admissible, so no other admissible function, no other admissible row will have smaller L2 integral. So that will happen next uh, session. If you have any questions about the this proof, if you have any doubts especially, please put them in the comments. And uh, we'll see you with the rest of the proof next.